3D printed guy. I'm kidding. <laughs> So I guess someone else might have done that. So, um, I think um, I think the main thing within that is um, I think um, as you're alluding to, it does seem like um, it's a cultural difference, and that's very hard to change overall. It takes years and decades to actually change that. But I think it's also just a small number of people can actually initiate that change. Um, so, for example, like Vicky's kind of the huge success story within Asia in terms of that being sold and acquired. Um, I think there's if there's more companies that are created. Um, and large institutions like DBS that's supporting it, I think overall that cultural change can happen. I do think that it does take time, so it's not going to happen tomorrow, but I think it is possible. And I think as long as people are still excited and continuously wanting to be entrepreneurial and building out their ideas, then, then it helps. Um, so, so on the first component, in terms of um, there being extremely low-cost wearables that are developed, I think, um, I think one of the key components, um, regardless of if you have a wearable device that is $10 versus $200, is making sure that the user experience is something that people actually want to use. Um, what, one thing about wearables is that it's not just a bracelet. It's, it, doesn't, it can't just look pretty if people want, want to actually have um, use it on a regular basis. It has to have some functionality to it, so being able to um, create a device that, whether it's low cost or, or more expensive, something that users actually want, want to use. And I think that's true for building any product in general. Um, I do agree with the problem in, that you alluded to in terms of, you know, like, I only have two arms. Like, I don't have an arm behind me or anything. Um, there's only so many devices that I can put on. And I think one of the key aspects is um, early on in the wearable devices, we saw um, devices like, for example, Lark that only tracks um, sleeping patterns and being able to um, have a silent alarm clock, for example. But then now, just within a couple years, um, within like three to four years, we we now see devices like the Moto 360, which um, has a health track fitness aspect. Um, that will track your number of steps, but you can also check your emails on it, um, make phone calls and text messages and whatnot. So I think um, having having a device that actually incorporates a lot of different functions has become a key part. Um, I would say that, um, ironically, probably the biggest challenge that I faced so far was when building Hello World and um, encountering a topic that out of the entire team I was supposed to be the expert on, but having a debate with um, the rest of the team about it, which was um, taking on financing for Hello World. Um, so actually, do we want to sign these term sheets with angel investors and venture capitalists? And um, I think that's probably, um, I think, um, that challenge itself is very specific, but I think the overall um, idea in terms of having to deal with co-founders and having to deal with other people on the team and actually convincing them to take your viewpoint and standpoint, that's been, that's been the most challenging thing. And I think it also alludes to, you don't want to work with teammates that agree with you all the time. You want people who are consistently challenging your opinion, um, pushing you to try to achieve something more. So um, the, the challenge that I had to, um, the most the most kind of intense challenge that I had so far was um, half the team wanted to take on this um, venture capital money that we were offered, and then the other half of the team um, were reluctant. So, and I was on the reluctant side, so um, having to deal with that. So, differences of opinion. Um, in terms of trends within, within social entrepreneurship, um, I think what's really exciting about social entrepreneurship is that. Um, um, over, I guess, um, early on when, um, in terms of nonprofit development, for example, the nonprofit that I founded in, in high school, we had absolutely no technology component. The only thing that was present within technology was we had a website, but that was it. And we used text messaging to communicate with each other. Um, but I think what's really exciting about the social entrepreneurship space is that we're seeing a lot of technology products actually being mirrored within the public service and public sector space. Um, so for example, um, Rubicon is a project that was started out of Palantir, so it's a nonprofit that spun out of Palantir in that um, they actually have um, 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 kind of robots and technology that can actually help during disaster relief. So I think um, a trend within social entrepreneurship is just this mirroring between technology and, and doing some sort of social good. I think, um, I think one of the key aspects in terms of um, creating an ecosystem for entrepreneurship. It's great that people are having the conversation around entrepreneurship and creating companies. 
Um, I think it's important to also have a solid foundation and base for that. So that, that, starts, um, that starts at a very early age. That starts within high schools, within universities. So actually having, um, so I think one of, um, uh, some of the biggest success stories that are apparent in the US and Silicon Valley actually came out of university lab research, for example. So um, for example, Google started because it was, they had this unique page rank algorithm that came out of the CS department at Stanford. There were PhD students who had worked on that. Um, there was also, for example, HP Hewlett Packard. It was created because um, there were these two master students um, which actually had unique um, oscill oscillator technology. So that was also created out of university lab research as well as um, Genentech and um, Facebook was a little bit later, but that also came out. So I think, I think that's one of the key things in terms of in order to create an ecosystem, it can't just be a couple people talking about wanting to start something, but it, there has to be a solid foundation for it. And um, with that solid foundation also comes strong technology. So I think over the past few years we've seen in Silicon Valley, um, there's been a lot of success with consumer stories, but I think um, there's been a lot of successes before that um, in terms of um, innovative software, innovative hardware, and having strong technology that actually is the basis for companies. So I think, I think that's one of the key important things when when trying to foster an entrepreneurship ecosystem. I would say that um, I mentioned mobile messaging as, as one area that I think Asia has done an incredible job at in um, Silicon Valley in the US, we're still trying to keep up with that. Um, I think along the same lines, another sector is the gaming sector. So. Um, the gaming sector in, in Asia is just like light years ahead of, of Silicon Valley. Just to be clear, it's not casino gaming. No, not <laughs> casino gaming. So we all, uh, so mobile gaming specifically. And that actually mirrors very closely in terms of mobile messenger apps in which um, their top monetization strategies are actually through games and people paying for, for example, power-ups and extra lives and um, being able to share that with friends. And I think, I think that's another space that Asia has been a leader in and I think Silicon Valley and the US has a lot to learn from. So um, I think um, those two sectors in terms of uh, messenger apps as well as, as well as games, I think that's something that I'm really excited to see what Asia does now. So that's a great that's a great question. That's, that's the whole reason why we are here. <laughs> we all want to we all want to hack a million. We all want to um, become billionaire. <laughs> um, so I think um, one of the there's I think there's um, there isn't one specific reason why, but I think there's a there's a suite of reasons. Um, so I think one of the main things is that. We um, focused very heavily on creating an app that we personally wanted to use. So everyone on the team, like we wanted to make sure that we were, we wanted to use the app on a regular basis. And um, I think that was one of the key things. And that was that um, being able to create a product that you know people actually want to use, or at least you want to use yourself. Um, that actually helped us gain a lot of users very quickly. Um, I think that wasn't that wasn't the only reason. We also had an extremely strong team in terms of. The engineers on the team, they had previously done a lot of open source work. So they had, for example, um, done work in HTML5. They, um, they were early contributors to Node.js, which is a very popular programming language. Um, they actually, um, they also helped, for example, develop the WebSocket protocol, which is used across um, all browsers and um, large companies also use it. So um, in terms of the team itself, we had a very strong tech team and we were able to also incorporate within our app, even though within um, kind of the front-facing user experience was very beautiful because we had we had an artist who had formerly developed art for Warner Brothers and um, um, lots of famous card games and had basically been an artist for a number of years. Um, we also had the strong tech side behind it. So um, the app itself was very fast. It worked very well. We had um, real-time locations and we had some interesting location technology around that. And I think those two things mirror together. We, um, when we were looking at um, different companies who might want to acquire the product, we looked specifically at a company called Life360 because the, um, our app was in the social location space and they were exactly in the same, same space so there was a lot of alignment within that. And then um, I think it also helped that we, um, we had the users and also um, the, the financial interest in both investing in the app and also people who wanted to acquire it. So um, that competitive aspect also um, helped help make sure that it wasn't 
It wasn't just um, a low, low figure sum that was required for, but. Um, so I think what was uh, really helpful for us is that um, I, had a, I had a friend who worked at TechCrunch um, and he actually worked closely with us to help us um, announce the launch for the app. So that was, um, so we had key partners like that. Um, so when we actually launched the app at the hackathon, we knew exactly like how it was going to be announced and how that was going to help. So that definitely helped in terms of we got lots and lots of downloads right when we launched the app and being able to have the app isn't fun if you only if you're the only person on it given that's a social app so the fact that we had a lot of users download it um, that actually helped in terms of drive more users to actually invite their friends as well I think having having the key partners are important so um, nowadays it's it's really easy to launch an app on within the Google Play Store you can launch an app within a couple minutes within the Apple Store it takes a little longer and that there's like a two-week cycle um, but overall um, as an individual, you can be one person and you can just launch an app and it's very easy and um, both Apple and Google have made that incredibly easy, but it's important to also have the key partners when you actually make that launch happen. I'm going to comment on the last two questions. Mm -hmm. and, you know, I, I, I hear what you're saying when you say that uh, Singapore moves at snail's pace, but I, I don't think it's, it's necessarily true you know, amongst the startups. I book, I work with startups and I know a lot move very fast. Mm -hmm. And you know, I'd like to you know, again highlight the point that you brought up. It's really about the culture. Mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's relatively easy to develop a strategy to grow a hack a product and to you know, make a million and to, you know, to, to build something quick and to sell something. I see a lot of great Singaporean uh, startups doing that already. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, you're right in saying it's really about the culture, mm -hmm. the culture of, um, you know, of Helping each other, connecting to you know, of, of helping each other to build connections. That's really important, and that's what we're hoping to build here in Singapore and Asia. And I think even this event itself, I mean, it was put together within a, about a month or so. So, um, and I think um, the pace that DBS Business Class has also moved at um, has been incredible, especially since DBS itself is a large, large organization and institution. So it's generally lot hard for large organizations. I'm sure that's true in the in the Bay Area as well uh, to move quick, but you know. Let's all move fast and we'll make something happen. Things Final are moving questions. fast, so. Indeed. Final question. Um, I think one of the challenges within, within the healthcare industry, so um, I personally am not involved with a lot of healthcare companies, but one of the challenges within that is that there, it's very capital intensive early on and it requires um, at least within the U.S. to go through federal regulations, um, the FDA, for example. And I think that's true of both healthcare as well as um, the energy sector and clean tech, in that both of them require um, a seed investment in a company in healthcare. It's generally not um, two or three million dollars, but a seed investment is like, whoa, it's five to six to ten million dollars for healthcare or clean tech. So I think that's one of I think that's one of the challenging issues with with building a company within healthcare or clean tech because of the initial capital that's required, but also um, it requires a lot of federal and government regulations. So for example, um, within energy as well, there's utilities and regulators that also manage that. So I think um, it's harder to move faster with, within that because of, because of those regulations. But overall, um, I mean, both healthcare and clean tech, they're billion dollar industries. So I think there's a lot of opportunity. We've come to the end on time. Uh, thank you for being such a great audience and for all those questions. Thank you, Edison, for sharing with us so much about your life and your successes. Um, and to the rest of you, see you at the next Bay Area series. We're, we're going to have uh, three or four or five or six lined up next year. It's all in the works. I know. But we're going to have a bunch of uh, these talks happening next year. And so stay tuned uh, with the DBS Business Class program. Um, and we'll see you again. Thank you.